Welcome to the Muscle Expert Podcast with Ben Pakulski, one of the world's top professional bodybuilders, an expert on human performance and mindset mastery. Ben dives deep to deliver the strategies of the top experts to upgrade your body, mind, muscle, strength, performance, biochemistry, and how to become the upgraded modern man. Hey, everybody. What's going on? Hope everybody's having an amazing day. I am your host of the Muscle Expert Podcast. My name is Ben Pakulski, and today I have the honor and privilege of interviewing a gentleman who's been a friend of mine for an extremely long time, someone who's had a tremendous impact on my life, on my understanding, and perhaps most importantly to me, in my ability to think outside of the box. I think the greatest gift in life is being able to think like nobody else can think, And every one of us has that ability if we can tap into it. And this gentleman today is, in my opinion, perhaps the greatest athletic trainer on the planet today. He trains Olympic athletes. He trains professional hockey players. He trains professional golfers, professional swimmers, uh, literally every professional athlete under the sun. And he does it at the highest level because he thinks he doesn't follow conventional wisdom. He doesn't read textbooks and do what they say. He has this tremendous thought process. So I asked our guest today, Andy O'Brien, to join me for a conversation about his thought process, about where it came from, about how he approaches performance, how he approaches recovery, some of the modalities he uses to take his athletes and his current team of athletes to the highest level of performance. Andy is currently the head of performance for the Pittsburgh Penguins and has been there for three years, two of which have been Stanley Cup wins, Stanley Cup victories. Uh, For those of you that don't follow professional hockey, the Stanley Cup is the highest level of attainment. It's effectively the Super Bowl. It's effectively the World Cup of uh, NHL hockey. So Andy is doing tremendous things with athletes and has been doing it for a long time. And I've been blessed to watch his journey from the outside and watch how he influences athletes uh, and just takes them to a completely new level, not only physically, but mentally by challenging these guys with, uh, to understand what they're truly capable of. Uh, I know you're going to love this conversation with a gentleman who I've known for an extremely long time. Um, without further ado, here's my conversation with Mr. Andy O'Brien. All right, man. So um, if you're cool, I just want to kind of pick your brain about what you're doing. Um, it doesn't have to be specific to the Penguins. If you don't want, you, it can be. But just, um, you know, high-level performance, injury prevention, recovery modalities, uh, the integration of speed, strength, and stability, um, kind of all those, you know, I just want to pick your brain on what are these, all these high level performance uh, avenues you're looking at. Yeah, for sure. I mean, obviously I've, I've been a, essentially a strength and conditioning coach, uh, by trade for about 20 years now. And, um, you know, been, I worked in the NHL, you know, mid twenties, uh, got hired in a traditional strength and conditioning role there and, and had a private business leading up to that. And that I kept while I was doing that and then had, had some, you know, some other opportunities to, to travel and start working with some, some elite athletes and working with, um, you know, essentially, uh, um, you know, in, individuals that have the resources to build high performance teams. So where you have four or five people collaborating with one individual, which is great sort of learning experience, which kind of steered me out of the traditional strength and conditioning role. You know, then you're sort of working with a few other people and, you know, trying to learn from them and trying to take on sort of a, a philosophy that's maybe not just your own, but, um, finding ways to integrate with other people. And then, you know, inevitably with hockey, just this organic nature of the game, um, specializing in hockey, I worked in different sports, swimming, baseball, as you know, uh, some different things. But but the thing with hockey is it's just really hard to understand the sport. So, um, so that just steered me in a different direction of just trying to study the sport. And so it became a lot less about actual strength and conditioning and more about, um, you know, okay, well, we'll really need to start to understand these physiologic demands. And so I guess... Um, Sort of my role now is is uh, yes, I'm always am and will be a strength and conditioning coach, but kind of just coloring into these areas that are sort of niche and and unique, asking different questions and exploring different things. So um, that just kind of led to this role with the Penguins, um, which is overseeing the performance side of things. Um, so working on the strength and conditioning side uh, with a couple of strength coaches uh, with the Penguins, but then also um, doing a lot of work in sports science and. Um, working with the coaching staff and the strength and conditioning staff and the medical staff collectively to uh, just pose questions, you know, develop different hypotheses and things that we want to track and look at and 
and then find ways to essentially apply that um, and make sure that the data we're collecting has influence over what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And then my private business, uh, which is based in Toronto, essentially just working with athletes uh, around the NHL and, and some different sports as well um, that are kind of doing the same thing, looking for training programs, uh, nutrition programs, um, and then just kind of overseeing and quarterbacking everything they're doing, whether it's a recovery standpoint or uh, what they do from uh, from an on ice standpoint, or you know, some athletes like you know, professional tennis, uh, you're trying to help with a variety of things, sleep, travel. Um, so I guess it, you know, that whole performance umbrella encompasses a lot of things. You know, always coming back to the coaching side of it, but uh, more and more data is just we're we're capable of getting it now, and I think the questions just get bigger and bigger as things get a little more spe specialized. Absolutely, Andy. You know, you're you're definitely the person that uh, the, the number one person I've ever come across as far as having an integrated approach to this whole piece, right? I've never seen someone who has such an in-depth uh, knowledge about every aspect of strength performance and, you know, ultimately every aspect that goes into making someone a great athlete. How did you begin with this thought process? Like, I'd love to just have a greater understanding as to, um, you know, how you began looking into the details that you look into. Well, first of all, thanks, man. I mean, obviously, you, you got one heck of a network, and I, I know you to be one of the most inquisitive. Man, and, I, I meet you know. everybody. Nobody <laughs> thinks like you. Nobody well, thinks like you. Well, I appreciate it, buddy. Um, well, I, th I think the big thing, Ben, is um, is you know if I re if I rewind a little bit and just picture myself as a strength and conditioning coach, I mean, everybody learns the same way. I mean, you learn some exercises, you learn some drills, you get a program, uh, you implement it, and I, I think one of the things that benefited me the most is having started out in an era where it was like pre-internet and you didn't have access to a lot of information and you just had to make observations and create content. Um, and, and I think that that kind of served me well with the way that I think in terms of having a problem solving skill set versus a knowledge base. Um, and then I think as I moved along and I started getting into different situations, I remember distinctly uh, you're working with the Florida Panthers as a strength and conditioning coach and, you know, being really into testing and wanted to correlate uh, different events that are taking place on the ice with things that are taking place off the ice and you know, seeing these things that I thought would relate, you know, these exercise tasks that seemingly would relate to skating. I mean, 20 meter sprint tasks, some jumping tasks, some power stuff, some squat tasks, um, and then just not seeing any correlation at all. In fact, we would do things like blood lactates and the VO2 max and then see that not really correlate to the guys that fatigue in, in games. And, you know, that was just puzzling to me and I was so curious. And I think what I realized is that you know, these things that we talk about, speed, power, recovery, uh, fatigability, they are extremely complex, you know, physiologic systems. And the, f the, the way that we see it isn't generic. The way we think about it is generic in our industry. So if I have somebody who can squat 500 pounds and I get them to squat 600 pounds and I've just increased their power, well, well, I really haven't. I've just increased their ability to squat more. And, right. and there's several different physiologic systems at play there. Uh, could be a muscular-based improvement. Could be an adaptation that's 100% technical. Uh, could be based on biomechanics. So really, you know, we really genericize too much. And I think for me, the more questions that I had and the more I failed to see one thing predict another, uh, I think it just was really humbling. And I started to dive into needing to know more about things that I didn't know about. And um, yeah, that, that probably, you know, studying a sport like hockey, that's just so complex and difficult to understand was, was the first thing. And then I think number, you know, the, the other thing being a trainer, Ben, is, um, you, you attach yourself to guys that you're in there, uh, through the highs and the lows and, and you're training these guys, becoming friends with these guys, you know, trying to go to war with them essentially to help them achieve their goals and, and, and see them put their heart on the line. You want to see them be successful so bad that, you know, when they're not successful, uh, you know, it just led led to a lot of questions and uh, guys going through injuries, you know, that would just force me to want to learn about those injuries. You know, if I trained a guy and he didn't do well, I always felt like I needed to understand what I could do differently or where we went wrong. And I was never afraid to admit that I went wrong. I mean, I, I still work with different people that teach me things and, and help me. And, and I can tell you 20 years into my career, I'm still learning things where I'm going, ah, you know, I can't believe I'm just learning this now. Like, I, you know, I, I, I wish yeah. I had known that a year ago. Like I, you know, as good as I thought, you know, things were going a year ago, I was really missing, you know, this whole paradigm. So I think it's just staying on that path and, and staying true to that is all, all part of it. So what are some of those things you've talked about things that don't correlate with athletic performance? What are some of the things that you find do cor correlate with athletic performance? 
Well, I think the best way to do it is to take athletic performance in general and compartmentalize it. So I think if you just take something like skating, for example, in hockey, uh, I don't know how many listeners are hockey fans versus uh, football, soccer, whatever it might be. But but if you take hockey and skating, um, you know, for the years, we would try to see, well, what predicts skating? But then I think you have to ask the question, well, what is skating? You know, what are we talking about when we talk about skating? Are we talking about straight line skating, pivoting? Uh, multi-directional skating if we are talking about multi-directional what type of turns what degrees what speeds um, you know how much ice are we covering like there's just so many different dimensions and when you actually stop and look at skating you realize well wow there's different many many different types of skills involved in skating and uh, you know at different parts of the ice there's different abilities different biomechanical factors different neuromuscular factors that lend themselves to these various skating techniques so you might be able to relate something to you know skating off the rush and then take a totally different set of physiologic attributes and relate that to the type of skating that takes place down low below the dots Um, you might view straight line skating multi-directional skating is very different Um, and then some of the pivots and turns and some of the um, you know change of direction type stuff are are also very very different Um, and and then you start factoring in well what kind of equipment is the athlete using what kind of boot is he wearing and so when you start to compartmentalize it, you, you start to see the correlations. So you start to see, okay, well, when I'm more specific about the physical qualities that I'm looking at and I'm more specific about the actual task, um, I can now break it down. So if I divide skating into 18 different you know, motor skill sets, then I can actually start correlating certain exercises or certain qualities from an off-ice perspective with each one of those categories. But if I start too broad, I never really get there. And so I think that applies to almost anything, whether it's you know weight training, whether it's um, bodybuilding, fitness, health, wellness, almost anything that you're doing. I, I think when you, when you look at it too broadly, um, you know, you're not going to really mine into it as much. So ultimately you have to just understand your task better and better. And then, then you can start to find those answers. Most strength coaches are focusing on getting guys strong, getting guys fast. Is there not as much of a correlation as most people would think as far as transfer to sport? Yeah, I think there is at a at a basic level. Like, I think if you were to take an athlete and just say, "Hey, hey, man, I, I want to. These are the exercises I know. I understand some of the basic barbell lifts. I understand some medicine ball work, some plyometrics, and I'm just going to make them better at that. And then that's going to make that person better on the ice. I think that's going to depend on you know how deficient they are from an on ice perspective. Yeah. I, I think if you start with somebody in year one, he's never trained before, and you do that, you're probably going to see a ton of improvement. Uh, but as you get higher and higher up you really have to have some level of specificity because their overall athleticism is already there. And I think, you know, I've always looked at, at transferability as a function of specificity across um, different physiologic systems. So is, is the drill biomechanically specific? Is it neurologically specific? Or is there an element of neuromuscular specificity? And, and you know, generally speaking, you don't always have to be specific to show improvements. Uh, but to some level, you you have to be able to identify okay where are the opportu- areas of opportunity, uh, and then how can I you know be very specific. So so that is to say that you know if I strengthen an athlete in a double leg environment, is that going to make him better at his single leg task? And and I think again at the basic level, yes. As you get more and more into expert level athletes, uh, not as much so. And then also, you know, we have some athletes that. You know, maybe they're doing all work in the sagittal plane. So reverse lunges, step ups, uh, single leg squats, uh, variations of leg presses. And then we realize when we actually start studying skating that a vast majority of the, of the acceleration patterns for that athlete are involving a crossover motion. So now if you actually study the crossover motion biomechanically and what's going on at the muscle level, you're going to see that that is a totally different set of physiologic demands than those exercises and so at some point you know there's a lack of transferability and you really have to start now training those muscles in the ranges that they're they're needed in and in the types of contractile patterns and you know we see this in lack of transferability from static movements to dynamic movements we see it uh, from one plane to another plane we see it in unstable environments to stable and so i think it just the more you understand the task and the more you can evaluate the athlete and identify where those areas of opportunities then you could specify the exercises and then really get some results. Hey guys, I interrupt the podcast to bring a special message from Organifi. I absolutely love the idea of convenience and health, right? So for many years, I was the guy juicing. I was the guy jamming things into my juicer, into my blender, trying to get as many different micronutrients and phytonutrients as I could. It takes time. It's ridiculously expensive. I mean, I used to try to put five to seven fruits and vegetables, always usually vegetables, 
into a smoothie with some lemon and tons of ice and some water. And it ended up costing me 20 to $30 per smoothie. Uh, you know, you go to Whole Foods, it's going to cost you 20 bucks just to get a juice. Uh, it's extremely expensive. So I'm extremely grateful that Organifi has been so gracious to offer you and me a 20% discount off their greens drink, which is an incredible tasting, nutrient dense array of superfoods. And it's honestly awesome. I use it daily. My kids even drink it. It's got a little minty flavor that just tastes awesome. They've also got the reds, which I'm an advocate of using pre-workout. I'm also an advocate of using a little bit after you work out uh, just to get those high polyphenols in there. Again, not immediately after the workout because we want to have that oxidative stress, but maybe an hour afterwards in with your meal. Great way to get some extra antioxidants and polyphenols into your brain, ladies and gents. Uh, and if you haven't tried the Organifi Gold, do it because you're going to thank me later. It's just an amazing tasting uh, calming formula that you know myself and sometimes my kids will enjoy before bed and i hope you guys take this opportunity to jump on it and take care of organifi because they're taking care of us uh, truthfully great stuff that i use every day my entire team here at the gym uses it and we're loving it rather than having to you know take coffee in the morning which i did for so many years and sometimes i still do it's really nice to have that uh refreshing, energizing green beverage in the morning. Add some ice, throw it in the blender. It tastes amazing. You can just shake it. It tastes great too. But I like to have it nice and cold. And uh, while I'm sitting there doing my reading first thing in the morning, uh, it's a great addition to my morning routine and gives me the energy I need for the day. And I know I'm covered, right? If I, if I don't end up eating all my vegetables for the day, I have my micronutrients covered. That's enough talking for me. Enjoy the rest of the show. You think so far outside of the box. I mean, I've seen you do things from, you know, off ice training to gymnastics to strength training to literally everything uh, I've, any athletic coach could subject their athletes to. Do you have a framework that you kind of base that around that seems to get you the best results? Like, do you have a, a you know, a percentage of strength training, a percentage of stability, a percentage of speed, uh, you know, gymnastics training? How do you begin to integrate all these things? Yeah, that's an unbelievable question because I think in in an industry, we look very often at, you know, here's something new and we think, oh, that's got to be beneficial. So here's the exercise of the month or here's a piece of equipment. You know, let's throw that in there. But I think what I've always tried to do, especially with any of the young strength conditioning coaches that I'm mentoring is, you know, if, if, if you see a drill, rather than just get excited about that drill and then do that drill, um, and that's, a, that's honestly, it's, it's a trap because athletes get excited about new drills. So when an athlete feels like they're learning something and they're getting better, there's this immediate, you know, rush of enthusiasm that they get, you know, there's an endorphin like, you know, effect of that, that motor learning or that task mastery. And so sometimes as a trainer, you can get caught in that, you know, here's something new, here's something different and, and you feed off that athlete's enthusiasm, but it could be misguided, you know, new and different isn't always better. So I always try to say, you know, a drill isn't just a drill. It really depends on why you're doing it and how you do it. Um, and so if I'm doing a, a specific agility drill or a foot drill, there's principles that, that I might need to implement in order to create an effect. So if I see an athlete and I see, okay, well, when he's skating, he's losing speed uh, off his turns because he, you know, he doesn't shift his center mass onto his inside leg. So I create four or five agility drills that actually practice um, you know, counter leaning onto your inside leg and loading that inside leg and exploding off of that leg. And then I ultimately wanna see that transfer back onto the ice. Um, you know, if I'm just throwing these drills at the athlete and he's not properly loading that inside leg, you know, I don't know how beneficial that drill is going to be. So every single drill, no matter what you're doing, if it's a basic butt kick drill or a foot drill, a basic lift, uh, the tempo that you choose, the mechanics that you choose, uh, the setup that you choose, the load patterns that you choose, everything has to be specific to a particular thing you want to accomplish. And I don't think any exercise or drill is right or wrong inherently. I don't think that there is a right or wrong way to do any exercise. I really believe that um, all of those decisions are context-based. And if you don't understand the drill and the athlete and what they're trying to work on, um, you know, you really can't provide enough context to make a transfer. You said you need a certain amount of foundational strength or foundational ability before you can really start getting, or you'll, you'll see a benefit from this foundational strength and foundational ability um, even before the, the, it's necessary to start integrating all these more complex patterns. How do we know when we're strong enough? Like, how do we know when, when strength is no longer uh, going to benefit me, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm training, I'm getting stronger, I'm getting stronger, I'm getting stronger. Uh, at what point have I done enough with that before I, I am not going to continue to see benefits? That's another for a specific athlete. Yeah, of course. That's another really good question. I think the best way to answer that, Benny, is always when you have a database 
of athletes and you have some like basic um, you know, test measures that you can have. Like for us, a lot of the testing that we do, we have a lot of sophisticated monitoring, but a lot of our testing that we do in preseason with our athletes, it's basically, it's exercises. So we just want to test their aptitude across a variety of different exercises. And then we want to, you know, identify, you know, how confident they are at those exercises as an indicator of overall physical development. And we might get a kid who's at a junior or at a college or whatever. And, you know, we know that, you know, we don't want to get too specific with that athlete. We want to have that athlete continue on this path of overall physical development. But, you know, we know that they're there once those numbers sort of reach a certain point where there's this plateau in, in the industry. And, and typically, you know, you can do that by looking at your data set. So if you have, you know, 200, 300 examples of athletes in a particular demographic, uh, hockey players, you know, athletes in a, in a certain cohort, you, know, you can try and identify where that plateau is across these exercises um, to the point where you feel like that, you know, this is the seal or the floor for this athlete that once they overcome that floor, you know, getting better in that particular exercise no longer has a real benefit to the, to the environment. And so I think you could honestly handpick a variety of different exercises and then try to understand where that floor is and, and save space for that thought process of, okay, well, I know once I get to that point, I'm no longer going to get further for that. And that those can be really basic exercises. I think we've all experienced that where you get up to a certain point and then you think, okay, I'm good with that. I need to move on it. Is there anything specific you've seen that has a very high correlation with getting guys fast? Yeah, there, there's no question. I think it applies to, it depends on whether it's running or skating. Um, in skating, single leg strength is a big deal and uh, foot turnover is a big deal. So their ability to turn their, their feet over, their limb speed, uh, is yeah. huge. And then just absolute single leg strength because there's so many uh, situations where there's change of directions in hockey. And uh, when you're changing direction, you have these counter leaning, which is that relationship between your center mass and base of support. And inevitably all these kind of like hard decelerations and reaccelerations are all single leg positions. So I think just having like just freaky single leg strength is, is really important. Ironically, when you're really good at these double leg tasks, like a, like a basic back squat, sometimes that can impair your skating because it can cause you to gravitate to these wide base of support positions in skating. And so mm -hmm. um, I, I really believe the same to be true in a lot of other sports too, tennis, uh, rugby, football, a lot of scenarios where you have these multi-directional running. I really think the single leg component is, uh, is really important. And, and I honestly don't think you can be strong enough um, in that single leg strength. One thing I see a lot in athletes that I've worked with in the past is lack of hip mobility, lack of, you know, quote unquote, hamstring flexibility. Um, how much does that play into someone's single leg uh, power output and how do you mitigate? What's your best mitigation strategy for overcoming uh, weak uh, pelvic musculature? Yeah, it's massive. I think you really have this two pronged way of looking at it, Ben. You, you, you really want mobility through the hip joint and you want stability through the pelvis. And, you know, when you don't have mobility through the hip joint, typically the pelvis becomes unstable to try and accommodate that lack of mobility. Um, so you really want to try to train those things. And I think it's important when doing, you know, to me, it's, it's a lot about the technique of the exercise. So you can do stretching exercises or different soft tissue work or band distraction techniques to try and increase mobility. But then when you go and move, um, if you're not stable through your pelvis, you're really training a bad motor pattern that's just going to lend itself to, you know, to tightening up and, and not moving through a full range of motion. So I think really training the movement and being very strict about your movements uh, are really key. Um, but then, you know, once, like to me, the reason why that relates so much uh, to speed and power and mobility is because essentially there are these energy leaks that take place at that particular part of the body. Um, so it's almost like having an incredibly powerful swing as a baseball player, but, you know, having a bat that's made of sponge you know, it doesn't matter how hard your swing is, if that's not transferring into the ball, um, you know, you're going to just have all this, all this wasted energy. And so I really think your pelvis is just, it, it's, it's so, uh, there's so many degrees of freedom there that there's so many opportunities for energy leaks. And so to me, that becomes really, really critical. Um, so I think it's very valuable. The, the other thing is when you want to change it, um, I, I honestly look at uh, range of motion um, with quite a bit of intrigue and, and curiosity, because I think traditionally we used to think, okay, well, he's tight through his hips, so we're just going to stretch that hip. And then we got away from static stretching and started doing dynamic stretching. And then there's myofascial stretching, and there's a lot of different soft tissue techniques. Uh, on, honestly, man, I've seen so many different scenarios where we're ticking every box of every gold standard technique, and then the athlete honestly doesn't change that much. Um, you just see them kind of come back with the same issues. And there's no question about it when you have an athlete who's never explored any of those basic modalities um, that you will see an improvement initially. Uh, but there are some that, you know, even when they're exploring all those modalities, they just, they just don't make a lot of change. And so that's where I think the central nervous system 
uh, and the genetics of the individual are highly influential. And there's some people that are just built for better range of motion than others. And I think, uh, you know, it's really interesting. Uh, Dan Paff, who's a, who's a guy that I have a lot of respect for in terms of the way he thinks, um, you know, he wrote uh, one, of, one of the athletes that, that I'm working with, particularly problematic with a lot of range of motion issues. Um, and, and it's been a big limiting factor for him. I actually got to see Dan. Dan wrote a report, sent it to the athlete and sent it back to me. He basically, the thing that stood out for me is, you know, these things are fixable. Uh, but, you know, with athletes that don't fall into the normal, you know, day to day approach, um, you're going to have to find what works for them. And so it's going to be different for everybody. So you may have an athlete, Ben, that that following their nutrition and finding out what they're doing nutritionally or their supplementation might be the thing that unlocks that limitation. For some people, it might be just understanding how they need to train so that their nervous system recovers properly. Uh, for some people, it might be looking at gut health. For other people, it is just working uh, that sort of myofascial sling. Uh, there's a variety of different ways to do it, but I think you start with just some some real basic um, you know, mobility techniques. And uh, I am a big fan of both static and active work, uh, breathing techniques, a variety of things to teach people to relax you know, when they move. And, um, you know, of course, I'm a big fan of the soft tissue work as well. What's your favorite soft tissue modality? Is it t- kind of situationally dependent? Yeah, I think, I think it's important. I think I've always been a big believer that when you're creating a soft tissue set, um, therapy session, you're not really looking at, um, you're not really looking at um, just changing the anatomical structure of a muscle. So it's not that you're just pulling a muscle and making it longer. What you're doing is you're creating a stimulus that stimulus has an afferent response into the brain and the nervous system, and then that nervous system is is creating a reciprocal response, and there's a neurochemical barrage that influences the tone of the muscle. And so um, that's why I think a lot of the movement-based techniques can be a little bit more permeated because there is more neuroplasticity. So when you do a little bit more static stretching, you might be alleviating tone of a muscle on a more temporary basis. And when you do a little bit more movement with load, um, and you know, whether it's like for me, a lot of the, the hip mobility techniques I'll use are, is pushing a sled. And then I'm just having the athlete push that sled in various scenarios, long, long strides, using the whole foot contact on the ground, crossover strides. Uh, we do a lot of pivoting drills, a lot of pivoting, um, uh, drills with medicine balls and bounding, um, to me moving through a full range of motion and teaching pelvic stability and hip mobility through those exercises is, is in my opinion, the best way to gain mobility. Um, separately from that, obviously, a lot of the different types of soft tissue techniques that work really well, um, dry needling, a lot of different joint pumping techniques, uh, like osteopathic techniques. Um, and honestly, I'm a huge fan of band distractions, which essentially, I think the master of, of those techniques is Kelly Starrett. Um, you know, a lot of the different techniques of creating yeah. decoaptation of the hip. And um, I, I honestly think the, the results with that are phenomenal. Awesome, man. You were started going down the path of the nervous system, and I know you're doing so many things to start paying attention to ultimately sympathetic, parasympathetic balance and um, how to optimize recovery. Can you walk us down the path of you know, how you're looking at um, optimizing athletes' recovery on a day-to-day basis? Yeah, for sure. I mean, the, the big thing that I like about um, you know, the autonomic nervous system is I, I'm a bit of a simpleton. I, uh, I'm not the... The complex things are sometimes they get a little over my head. So the thing I love about the autonomic nervous system is it's a very, it's a very antagonistic system. You know, the sympathetic and these parasympathetic systems they have a tendency to, um, you know, to uh, to antagonize each other. And so some athletes are more sympathetic dominant, some are more parasympathetic dominant. Um, and you know, as one system increases, typically you have a little decrease in the other system. Cer- certainly, there is a lot of overlap, and and uh, certainly you require both at all times, but. Uh, but essentially, I use HRV, and I like HRV. It's a very simple thing. There's free apps that you can use to look at HRV. And when I've looked at HRV of like fairly large groups of athletes and demographics, um, and we look at them over time, uh, we see tons of really beneficial a- applications. And so, one thing we know is that you know if we you know take a look at somebody's morning resting RMSSD and we get enough data of that you know probably a couple of months it is even when we look at that with 24 hour HRV and we look at it with a variety of other applications you know low frequency high frequency ratio we generally find that the the morning resting RMSSD um, you know after a really really solid baseline is pretty predictive of like how you know parasympathetic or sympathetic are you and so if you know i use those terms very generally just for the purpose of the, of the discussion obviously these things can be a little more complicated but but if you're somebody that's really at the far end of the sympathetic spectrum typically we find that you carry a lot of tone 
in your tissue. So you're, you tend to be less flexible. Um, you're very tight, very rigid. Usually you have um, uh, a capacity for, for speed and power, um, you know, limb speed. You're usually produce these really short muscle contractions. And then you have a lot of what I call cortical output or central nervous output or efferent output, which is just, you, you tend to have a lot of like out, outbound power in your nervous system. Um, and then far over in the other side of the spectrum, on the parasympathetic side, you have these athletes that, that don't necessarily uh, do well with limb speed. Um, you know, they don't carry a lot of muscle tone. They tend to be very flexible. Um, and, you know, they have a tendency, you know, to have a different set of complaints. Um, I find athletes that are highly sympathetic or sympathetic dominant, they tend to be at risk of chronic muscle injuries. So they don't handle volume as well. Uh, their muscles don't remodel as fast. Um, you know, they need a little bit more recovery. They tend to do better with like a less is more approach from a volume standpoint. And then you have these, uh, these parasympathetic athletes that they need the volume to create the hormonal response to adapt to their training. Um, so they tend to be more volume dependent. And, you know, interestingly in hockey, we get these sympathetic athletes. The number one complaint they have is I'm gassed. You know, I'm tired. I feel like I'm not recovered from the previous day. Uh, the parasympathetic athletes, the number one thing that they complain of is that they have no, no pop. So they feel flat, they feel stagnant, and need to get more pop. They very, very complain, very, very rarely will complain of too much volume. So these patterns are really interesting to me. And when you look at it with, you know, what I know and understand about sort of the neuroendocrinology and the endocrine sciences around it, you, know, you have these sympathetic hormones, these, these hormones that are associated with, you know, things like testosterone and things that get secreted with high levels of intensity. Um, and then you have these parasympathetic related endocrinology, which is associated with adaptation. And, you know, very, very obvious to me, the parasympathetic athletes are way more muscular. They build muscle very easily. Usually they, they want to add, you know, do things not to build muscle in our sport because they can be a little too muscular. Mm -hmm. uh, the sympathetic athletes tend to be a little more hard gainers, you know, and that kind of makes sense. You know, the, the phases that they're in neurologically tend to lend themselves to, um, you know, to, to a type of muscle contraction and a type of neurologic output. Um, and then it gets slightly more complicated in the sense that you can be parasympathetic, you know, when you're training, but then sympathetic when you're not. And then you can be an athlete that's highly sympathetic when you're training or carries these big heart rate, you know, spikes and very acute spikes in heart rate and very high heart rate zones, much like a sympathetically dominant athlete would, but then you're parasympathetic after you turn that off. So, um, so there are these mixed types and these alternating types, but the cool thing about our sport is that in a, in a sport like hockey, we get these extremes, these guys that are enormously parasympathetically gifted. And we find those athletes like they, you know, sometimes they, they're operating in games at like 50, 60% of their heart rate max. But what that allows them to do is that they have a greater capacity for cognition during their training. So they can think the game better. They tend to be really good game players. They have excellent motor learning skills. They tend to be in that sweet spot of arousal where they can learn a little bit more. Um, and so then you get these sympathetic athletes that just get totally wound up. You know, they're probably crush. You know, they're probably the type to crush a million Red Bulls or, or some caffeine <laughs> before a game. Yeah. And then they, they just turn the dial way up, and, and they're just going a million miles an hour, and, and, and their heart rate spikes and it stays up, and it doesn't come down very quickly. So the cool thing about our sport is because we have all these extremes, it's fascinating because you can study, you know, what each predominant nervous system does on on all these different levels from a recovery standpoint, from a nutrition standpoint. Uh, isolating and, and individualizing recovery modalities for each one of these autonomic neural types. And, you know, that's, that's where it becomes so fascinating. So if you're a sympathetic type and you go out and have a workout and you finish your workout and your heart rate is still buzzing and it's buzzing for another three to four hours, you know, do you want to do a recovery modality like whole body cryotherapy that's actually just going to tax that system even more? Um, you know, if your problem is that you've got too much chronic activation in that system, you know, is, is a, is a recovery modality like that ideal for you where you're just going to release more of those catecholamines and, and just going to stimulate your nervous system that much more? Or are you better to do something sedating like a frequency specific microcurrent or, you know, some of the different types of techniques, you know, that might be just better to work at the myofascial level, maybe some Normatec boots or some different things that, you know, some soft tissue work, uh, you know, that, that tends to, you know, help the remodeling of the tissue and calm your nervous system down a little bit more. 
um, you know, not surprisingly, we do see these athletes are highly sympathetic. They, they do very well with high doses of magnesium and, uh, you know, things that can calm the nervous system. Ashwagandha tends to be a really good choice for them. On the parasympathetic side, you know, you want these more stimulating things. So they do a little bit better with things like whole body cryotherapy and they might do well with something like rhodiola, you know, which is a little, which is a similar type of adaptogen to ashwagandha, but a little more stimulating to the CNS uh, versus an anxiolytic. Um, you know, they tend to not do well with magnesium, but they do well with B vitamins, for example. So there's, there's a, there's a variety of different things that, that I've just explored. And it's, it's, it's mainly anecdotal, to be honest. Um, you know, we do have some data to support it. Um, and we use heart rate variability on a day-to-day -day basis to predict, to individualize workload, um, to individualize some supplementation. Uh, I, I can say for one thing, if, if you're coming in for a workout on a random Wednesday, Ben, and you know, your HRV was dropped, your RMSD was dropped and you're a little more sympathetic, um, then, you know, I might say, okay, well, probably like with our athletes, their heart rates increase in practice when they come in and they have uh, a decreased RMSSD. So if they're more sympathetic coming in the day, their heart rates are in these higher heart rate zones typically. And so what's fascinating about that is I know probably the amount of carbohydrate I need to deliver during exercise is now, is now more, uh, because there's just an increase in caloric demand. There's an increase in probably, you know, um, glycogen as an energy source or glucose as an energy source. Um, so if you come in and you're more parasympathetic on a given day, now your heart rate profile might change and it might be more of a flat curve, more of an aerobic curve. You might be expending less energy. So maybe it would be advantageous to actually take the carbs out of your meal, create something that's a little more ketogenic, actually deplete your glucose so that your nervous system will turn on to try and produce more ATP for you. And that's going to lend itself to your performance. So, so we would use HRV in that way to fine tune uh, a lot of different things. And, and that's uh, not to say that that's a, that's a hard science that I've arrived at, but I, I find it fascinating. I find it easy to learn. Uh, and I'm a big fan of just, you know, observing the, the athlete anecdotally, getting to know what works for them, and then trying to look at the data and see if we can see a relationship. So much value in that, Andy. Thank you. Um, one thing I'm curious about is you, you're managing so many athletes. Do you have very specific metrics? Um, is, or is it just that one metric of, of HRV that you're looking at? So you're at your, whatever, 20 athletes comes into your office today and says, hey, Andy, here's my HRV from this morning, or maybe you have it automatically sent to your computer. Um, is that the, the number one metric that's going to determine um, what they're going to do for the day, or is there other things you're looking at? Yeah, great question, because I, I really believe that every time we're looking at data, uh, no matter how excited you get with data, and we've all made this mistake for those who are working in sports science or statistical um, science, you know, the, the, there are limitations to everything that we can collect. I mean, even if you do, I mean, you know, biochemistry labs with an athlete, I mean, it's really just a snapshot. These are markers, they're indicators. Um, so I always look at every data point is, is a conversation starter. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to help direct you to... Um, who you're talking to and what you're talking about and what you're looking at. It's going to draw your, your eye to maybe something specific that you want to take a closer look at. So we never hang our hat. We don't use them diagnostically. And in addition to that, to answer your question, one metric, you know, is, is in my opinion, it's not enough because there's always confounding variables that could affect that metric. But when you see, you know, if I have an athlete that comes in and his RMSSD is dropped and his, you know, perceived energy is dropped, and some information about his sleep is, is decreased in value. And then we see this increase in heart rate during practice compared to what their norm is. Um, you know, now we've got three, four, five data points that are suggesting a pattern or a trend. And, you know, when we see one data point that's not consistent with the others, then all it does is it says, hey, something's up. Let's go find out what. And, and sometimes we do find out that, oh, okay, well, it's just quite possible that, you know, this test was affected by, you know, your drive to the rink that day or whatever it might be. And, and I think that there is always going to be that sort of 10 to 15% of the information you're looking at is, is unreliable, but it becomes more reliable and you have more confidence around it when you're, you're running it against three, four metrics and then looking at those uh, holistically. Talk to me about the frequency of your practices and games and how you optimize recovery because you guys are playing a lot and you're practicing a lot and you're integrating strength training into that. How do you begin approaching a recovery protocol for people at this level? Obviously, it begins with the HRV. I get that. Subsequent to that, where does it go? Yeah, I think the applications are, are numerous. I mean, we're constantly looking at uh, anything we can do to recover because we're dealing with an athlete in an imperfect state. Um, you know, if we just take a calendar and we code it, you know, red, yellow, green, you know, maybe an orange in there in terms of like green being fully recovered and, you know, yellow being suboptimally recovered, you know, we're, we're dealing with very few greens on a day-to-day -day basis. And so 
um, recovery is just a premium for us. So we've used, we, I tend to look at recovery in the, in the multifaceted way. There's ways to recover the CNS, there's ways to recover the muscle tissue. Uh, there's ways to, you know, maybe have an immune approach to that. Um, so everything from, you know, contrast bathing and, and hydrotherapy, which I'm a big fan of. We, we do use whole body cryotherapy, which I'm also a fan of. Um, there are things like frequency specific microcurrent um, and different types of muscle stim units that can be very good from a, from a recovery standpoint. Um, nutrition and supplementation is obviously huge. Uh, we do different things with breathing. Um, you know, different types of uh, routines uh, that, that players can have. Uh, wearing things like blue light blocking glasses after games is important. But all of those things are the recovery modalities, the applications we use. Uh, the other one I, I was going to mention, which I really like, are the fireflies, um, which is basically something that was designed to help with uh, like deep vein thrombosis and like improving circulation to the lower leg. Uh, but they've done some studies with, with athletes and found out in order to get blood flow to lower leg, you have to pump it through, you know, from your heart down through your upper leg and yeah, it kind of pumps the whole circulatory system. So uh, I really like fireflies. It's something worth checking out if uh, if you haven't. But I'm not familiar with what that is. What is it? It's pretty cool. It basically just looks like a band aid. It's a it's a little sticky uh, band aid that you put basically right on your um, on your fibular head, and uh, and that's for, you know right uh, around where the the common peroneal um, nerve is. And so if you if you press uh, the button, it just basically creates a tiny little stim current. Uh, to stimulate that nerve and it's going to create a little contraction in your tibialis and so you can actually create these like submaximal contractions in your tibialis and sleep with it and those submaximal contractions are going to require uh, blood supply so it's actually just kind of pumping your blood uh, and they've done some research with things like creatine kinase and some different you know blood-based you know markers of, uh, of of muscle damage and found it that it helps with recovery and then anecdotally i found it's worked really well for us in back-to-back games and, and whatnot as well um, Super interesting. Yeah, really, really cool technique. But but here's the cool thing about hockey, and, and I'll use hockey as an example. But uh, I think you can apply this to anything. We have players that will come into the rink in the morning after a game, having played, let's say, ten minutes, and they are exhausted. Right? They drag their feet. You see it in their body language. You, they've got bags under their eyes. They're tired. They look like they're tight, sore, full of inflammation. Furthest thing from ready to exercise, and. You know, I, th- I kept thinking to myself, and, and everybody says the same thing for years. You know, people would say this in the game, oh, I played a game last night, we're tired, played a game, we're tired. When you actually look at the work that's being done in a game, you know, it takes about two and a half hours. Periods are about 35 minutes long each. Whole game's two and a half hours. The top forwards are playing, you know, 18 to 20 minutes. So they're doing 18 to 20 minutes of work. It's intermittent work, by the way. Um, so there are some shifts, like power play time in there, where, yeah, you're not getting hit, you're not moving a whole lot. Um, you know, even in the penalty kill, um, you get into these scenarios where, you know, you might not be moving very much. You could be doing like a passive box scenario. So why is it so friggin' fatiguing? You can take an athlete and that same athlete, throw them in a practice for two hours and they can do quadruple the workload and recover from that within 20, you know, very quickly. So, so what I started to say is, okay, well, there's something's going on adrenally with this athlete. We're dealing with catabolic hormones we're dealing with a, a total adrenal cascade that's influencing how this athlete feels how they're producing you know atp uh, how they're responding hormonally and i think we just build a lot of stress hormones so the reality is at 5 30 that athlete starts to get stressed they start to get aroused um, you know they start to produce um, you know a certain type of endocrinology that's associated with uh, with stress and um, when you have that chronically over time uh, you know, you come in and that night it's hard for you to sleep because you're hyper aroused, you know, so your sleep cycle isn't, isn't quite as productive. And then you come in the next day and you're stiff, you're sore, you know, you're recovering from that stress cycle. So I actually liken it to somebody who might be like a stockbroker type lifestyle, you know, where you're stressed all day long and you're producing a certain type of endocrinology and, you know, you're, you're finding yourself just tight, sore, you can't sleep, you get some insomnia from that, you get some inflammation. And to me, the best thing for that individual would be exercise. So, you know, when you exercise that individual, you are now going to decrease their stress hormone profile. You're going to increase endorphins. They're going to release stem cells, all these beneficial things that we know about exercise, circulation, the whole deal. And, and you're using that sort of metabolic physiologic load to counterbalance the stress that they have. We, we know this works and we've seen it. Everybody knows that. So from a hockey perspective, you know, we take this paradigm shift in Pittsburgh and say, well, actually... We need to actually increase workload uh, when we have athletes in that state, even though it might not be, um, it, it might not necessarily seem right to the athlete at first. 
you know, if we create the argument, like, look, you know, here, here's what's going on. This is what you're feeling. This is what we see in your data. Um, but we think that actually inducing metabolic load can actually be a reciprocal for these other types of responses uh, that you have that are, that are primarily catabolic. And so, so I look at it as having this kind of central neural load and metabolic load as these two distinct categories that need to balance each other. And when you're too neurally driven and you're not metabolically driven enough, that imbalance leads to some of these problems, um, especially when you're playing games at night. Um, so what we want to do is try to induce some metabolic load. And typically when we do that, um, it brings our heart rate down, uh, creates more of a parasympathetic response. Um, you know, we see improvements in circulation, so our tissue remodels faster. We see a change in hormone production. Um, you know, a lot of this is, is a combination of some markers and measurements with some, you know, anecdotal, uh, you know, theories and applications. But, but for me, I think that it's, it's the one that's really stuck. And, you know, from our standpoint, we're, we're actually not looking at fatigue as something you back away from necessarily. We look at fatigue as something that, that you can work through and you can fine tune. I like that a lot, man. That's there's brilliance in that. Can you tell me approximately what? I mean, obviously hard to generalize, but approximately what type of protocol you'd be looking at when somebody comes in the fatigue? Is it just like some light aerobic, or we can do some some anaerobic stuff? We can do some lifting. What type of protocol do you usually uh, prescribe? Yeah, for sure. I think 100% the aerobic side is really important, Benny. I think if you get somebody who's overtrained or you know who has had you know some kind of um, you know let, let's call it what I you know the way I call it, which is basically this imbalance between their central nervous system and their and their their muscular system or their metabolic system. I think you got to do some combination of some, some aerobic work, you know, some probably moderate intensity aerobic work uh, combined with muscle endurance. So you need some kind of muscle fatigue. So I think if you're training like relatively high rep, low load um, muscular work, um, I think that, you know, that's where creating that effort response that lends to the neurochemistry that counterbalances the opposite side that you're experiencing. Very, very cool. So you've got your uh, your kind of finger on the pulse of all of your athletes. I'm very curious how much you're controlling the outside variables in their life. So uh, obviously these guys are pro athletes. How much are you dictating, you know, water intake and supplementation and food? And because and, obviously that's going to play a huge role into HRV and, you know, the preparedness of the central nervous system and musculoskeletal system. Oh, yeah, there's no question. I mean, I one of our athletes, you know, I was talking to the other day. Um, you know, who's a, who's an athlete that has a tough time putting on muscle, um, you know, burns a ton of calories, carries these extremely high heart rates, like a traditional, very sympathetically dominant athlete, um, in practice and, and can get very depleted over time. You know, he was telling me the other day, he just implemented a, a hydration strategy where he was just a little more mindful of his hydration pre-exercise. So I think he mentioned he was doing a, a liter and a half of water pre-exercise, um, you know, to improve his hydration, then he found that he, he loses more or sorry, he loses less now during his training. And because he's losing less, he's probably maintaining a better core temperature. So his core temperature is not rising as much. He's probably not burning as many calories, he's probably not getting as many stress hormones built. So just that hydration strategy alone is, you know, totally changing the physiologic response. Um, so there's no question about it. Sleep, stress management, um, uh, hydration, uh, everything you're doing. I mean, there's definitely the training stimulus has to be looked at. Everything they're doing when they're not training has to be looked at equally. Uh, and then you have to look at the long-term plan as well. So to control everything, man, you know, I wish I could. I wish I could completely dictate or put some kind of chip in every athlete's uh, neck or something that caused me to be able to control Elon Musk says we're about three years away from that. <laughs> we're, we're actually not that far away, right? Yeah, I, right. I joke about it with my athletes all the time. I mean, I see that, you know, diabetics now, they have these implant chips uh yep. you know that are continuous continuous glucose monitors um you know i a i want one for myself first yeah, of all exactly. but but I, i'd love to have one of my athletes that would give me so so much information but yeah i think i think at the end of the day you know athletes want to feel like athletes you know they don't want to feel like robots and and you have to respect them um you have to sell it i mean it, to, for me to tell an athlete what to do versus explaining to him why I'm recommending something. Here's my observation. This is what I'm recommending. I really think this is going to make a difference for you. If you can really articulate it and illustrate it, I think you get buy-in. And uh, that's so different than just telling the athlete, hey, you got to do this. So you just mentioned your athlete there with a high amount of sympathetic arousal, uh, tends to burn through a lot of calories. Would this be someone um, who would probably want to steer away from stimulants versus someone maybe who has the higher parasympathetic arousal, maybe would benefit more from stimulants? Well, it's pretty interesting you say that. Yes and no, I say it, w it would be the way I'd answer that, Ben, because um, there's no question about it that that athlete who's already sympathetically dominant, especially when you're dealing at a high level, 
they got to where they are by riding that system. You know, that's what they know. And so they're going to, you know, if you try to sedate that athlete, you know, in their training, they're going to feel totally out of sorts. So, so to a certain degree, what we want to do is try to keep them doing what they're doing, but we want to try to control it and counterbalance it on the other end. And so with that athlete, I might suggest them, Hey, can we pull the stimulants down a little bit? Um, you know, can we change the stimulant a little bit? So if you're a caffeine person, can we, can we add some feigning to that caffeine and just try to, you know, this, um, you know, modify the over arousal a little bit and the excited excitability. And so we would generally take that down, but always knowing that they're going to end up on the side of needing that stimulation, probably a little more than average. So we're just trying to really control the extremes. Um, and then same thing with a parasympathetic athlete. If you were to go to that athlete and say, Hey man, here's the, here's uh you know, here's a bunch of stimulants I want you to take to get your nervous system turned on. They're just going to feel out of sorts because they're depending on these low heart rates and these motor skills and, and, these different physiologic signatures. That's what they know. That's what's familiar to them. So, so I definitely think what you're trying to do is steer them away from the far ends of the spectrum, but you're trying to keep them within what, what they normally do well. I think you're really accurate with that. And yeah, like I, I work with a lot of athletes and including myself, I mean, you know me now and I'm, I'm a very parasympathetic, I would say more than most people. So adding muscle is a thing. If I take too many stimulants, I feel completely out of sorts. You, you know, it's, it sounds like you're definitely on to a very accurate assessment. Last time I checked, you build muscle fairly easily too. So I'd say that uh, I'd say that's about right. That's what they keep telling me, man. I don't know. <laughs> it's funny actually because I I know uh, you to be a Toronto guy. You know, from High Park, uh, for all the Toronto listeners there, that uh, there's a lot of like uh, Eastern European, Polish, you know, descent in that area, Ukraine. Uh, I, I've just found a lot of Eastern European uh, genetics to be highly parasympathetic personally, um, and you know they tend to do well with you know the ketogenic style of diets and you know, they tend to carry these low heart rates and, and high intensity training protocols can do very, very well for that type of athlete. Um, you know, me on the other hand, I, I, I come from the Maritimes. We have a lot of Irish, Scottish there. We're, we're fired up uh, <laughs> at the, at, you know, even when we're, when we're fired down, we're fired up. We have to drink a lot to try and get our, uh, <laughs> trying to get our nervous system to calm down. So, you know, we, we're just these fiery groups of people that are pumping out cortisol, like, uh, you know, setting world records. And so, yeah, we're, we're sort of the opposite. You know, we, we need carbohydrates. We live on, you know, you look at the Gaelic roots and you're living on a lot of root vegetables, living a lot of like, uh, you know, resistant starches, slow burning carbohydrates, greens. So, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of logic behind it. And, you know, there are these patterns that I think have emerged. And um, there's actually a guy on our team, Jamie Alexiak, I'll use his name. I mean, he's a very similar Polish guy from Toronto, 6'8", 255. Uh, r- reminds me of you a lot, actually. Like, builds muscle very easy. Uh, big dude, you know, but you know, his style of training has become all about limb speed and all about power. Um, and that, that seems to be what he responds really, really well to. I want to finish with some of your core principles for performance. So, and I'm, I'm referring like, what are the basic things that you're going to say that everyone needs to be covering if they want to optimize their performance at whatever they're doing right now? Um, can you rephrase that for me, Ben? Sure, man. Um, core principles for, for performance, meaning, Um, if I want to be better at, uh, bodybuilding, if I want to be better at, uh, hockey, like, is there some basic things that you think nobody should be going without? Nobody should be overlooking. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, I think at the end of the day, the first and foremost thing, I think we've all, we've all experienced this is, um, you know, don't try to get, have the perfect plan. Just try to have a plan and then, and then try to execute it extremely well. Right. And once, once you have really good discipline, and you have really good attention to detail, you create an environment that you can learn from, um, you know, document as much as you possibly can. Um, you know, and then I always try to allow the reflection to occur periodically. So, so do a program phase, execute the phase, uh, document as much as you can, and then sit down at six weeks, eight weeks, you know, three months, whatever it's going to be and evaluate, try, try not to evaluate every day. Um, try not to show up uh, to your training and then think, uh, you know, this is what I'm feeling today. So I'm not sure if, if I should do that. Try not to second guess your program because when you look at things with a wide lens and you're looking at a period over time, your judgment is just so much better. When you try to evaluate things in these short periods of time, um, you know, you just, you have a tendency to use these like gut responses that, that tend to not be very accurate or they're, they're spur in the moment doubts that you might get. So that's the first and foremost thing I think that sometimes people skip over those little fundamentals uh, to try and find something technically. Um, and then honestly, the, the, the one big thing, I mean, I was alluding to something uh, earlier um, that I was learning about this summer. And, and there's a guy, when I was in Florida, the physiotherapist there was a guy named Steve Deshavi. Uh, Steve's online. You, you can find him. He's a brilliant physiologist. He's a, he's a physiotherapist. He's got his doctor of physiotherapy. He's got a PhD. He's a, 
He's a biomechanist. I mean, he's a super smart guy. Taught me a ton. And, you know, I, I brought Steve up to Pittsburgh uh, to work with myself. One of my athletes just wanted to pick his brain on some things, show me some different perspectives. And the one that's really interesting is when we're doing pelvic work, hip and pelvic work, when we're doing glute activation, is really, you know, looking at the rotary component of all of these muscle groups. So looking at, you know, that the, the, the body in terms of these fascial slings instead of individual muscles. And then when you look at these fascial slings, and even if you look at the, the fibers of the muscles, a lot of times you're dealing with these like oblique, you know, fiber orientations and these, um, you know, these cross lateral, um, you know, applications of, of muscular activation. And so you can really improve the recruitment of a muscle group or, uh, a, or a muscle in itself when you incorporate the entire sling and when you incorporate a rotational stress. Um, and it made so much sense. I mean, I was just looking at glute max activation, pelvic stability, and looking at some single leg applications where I could increase space in the hip. And typically for me, I would think a posterior pelvic tilt, you know, so if I get into a posterior pelvic tilt, okay, well now I'm, I'm creating some changes in the, you know, in the length tension relationship and producing a little bit more space in the hip, but doing that and incorporating the opposite side shoulder or the contralateral shoulder, and then incorporating a rotational aspect of that movement. Uh, it honestly was a light bulb moment for me, man. And, and, you know, it, I don't, it's not that I didn't understand the physiology before, but I never felt it. I never played around with it. I never dove into it enough to truly feel it. And once I felt it in myself, it, it was totally changed my world. So you got to gotta pull that out a little bit for me. So when you talk about um, external rotation of, of the glute, posterior pelvic tilt, got it. So then it's, let's, we're talking right side glute, left side shoulder. What am I doing with that shoulder? Is it a retraction thing? Is it a rotation thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you, it's basically kind of creating... Um, creating tension so you could use bands for example yeah so if i'm if i'm doing a reverse lunge i'm going to step back with my left leg and i'm training the right leg yep and i'm working on glute activation at various phases of that reverse lunge mm -hmm. i might throw a band around my back that's pulling my left shoulder into rotation so that i can rotate in and rotate out as i'm doing the reverse lunge and now i'm incorporating you know all the fascia that's going all the way up through the opposite side of the back onto the shoulder um, you know, and I'm, I'm incorporating that whole kind of, uh, you know, thoracal lumbar fascia into the movement. So the arm's just hanging out at your side and you're doing internal external rotation of the glenohumeral joint? Um, yeah, I actually would just put the band right around the shoulder and then I would rotate the trunk. So you're essentially, oh, yeah, okay. so essentially kind of using trunk rotation with hip extension. And so what you're doing by doing that is instead of, you know, we're all familiar with like clamshells and like mini band work, you know, instead yeah. of rotating the femur off the pelvis, you're rotating the pelvis off the femur. Gotcha. So, so as you're going into hip flexion, you're ro you're rotating the pelvis forward, and then as you're going into hip extension, you're rotating the pelvis away. Gotcha. Awesome, man. So much value there. And now, the the most important question of the day, and the last one of the day, is who's going to win the cup? <laughs> you know, it's pretty interesting. Like, probably, um, I mean, I worked worked with a team years ago. We we weren't a good team. We we didn't make the playoffs. But I I had a an awesome time as a young strength conditioning coach. Gary Roberts was on that team. Joe Neuendijk, Ed Belfour, Roberto Luongo. Um, we had Marty Jelen, like some real, real cool guys, some legends um, in the game. And, um, you know, that, that was a great experience for me. But it was interesting coming back a few years ago and starting to work with the Penguins and just being a fly on the wall in those, those two cup runs. I mean, um, we were the first team in 19 years to win back-to-back -back championships. And if you look at the previous teams that had gone to the finals multiple times in the last 10 years, you got Chicago, LA, Boston, um, you know, these teams, they would have, a, they would win and then they'd, they'd fall off the next year and then they'd have a good year the next year and then they'd fall off. And I think that's a demonstration of just how hard it is to do it on a continuous basis. And so, you know, being a fly in the wall, like that truly, I really look at what that team did and that truly was a special accomplishment, um, but extremely difficult. So amazing how even with the same team, that second year was so different. We had a different set of challenges, a different, uh, different mentality, you know, coming off of a different summer, different coaching dynamics. Everything was different about that second year than the first year. Um, but, but looking at the way teams work together and what actually goes into winning, I don't think I really understood winning at the level that I do now back then, but being able to just observe people like Sidney Crosby and Chris Letang and Evgeny Malkin and Matt Cullen and Chris Kunitz and Trevor Daly and all these guys that, in my opinion, are winners. You know, they've, they've been around, they've done a lot of winning. And, um, you know, I think at the end of the day, um, it's not going to be the team that has the best team on paper. It's going to be the team um, that knows how to make each other better. So, 
I really view a locker room as a kind of like a sanctuary where people just have to pull together, respect each other, challenge each other, make each other better, have each other's backs. And so uh, honestly, I feel like our team is there this year, uh, much more so than last year. And, and I'm excited for the season for that reason. And as far as looking around the league to find that, like I find the Toronto Maple Leafs like really intriguing right now. Um, you know, I've got a few clients there and, and I find obviously everybody's really excited in Toronto. Uh, but I think it's going to come down to whether they have that dynamic from an offense perspective. Um, and, and I gotta tell you, I still got a beef with the GM of the Penguins for getting rid of Kunitz, man. I mean, that really hurt my feelings. It's pretty, <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I know, pretty grateful that he came to Tampa, but, uh, you know, I'm still pretty pissed off with the Penguins, although I'm still a Penguins fan just cause you're there. I know. Well, Tam- I mean, you look at Tampa and the firepower that they have, you know, and I think looking at Tampa, I thought last year, man, who's going to beat this team? But, but again, it just shows you how difficult it is. It's not just about good players. And that's what I think makes hockey so special as a sport is, is I mean, it's just, there's so much of it is just about, you know, working together and overcoming adversity together as a group of people, first and foremost. There's a lot of talented players, a lot of talented teams. Uh, but it's all these, like, these human factors that, that end up kind of being the difference maker. So I think all the yeah, great, sure. all the great stories, you know, they, they come with these, these amazing people behind them. Andy, so much love and appreciation for you, man. Thank you very much. You too, Ben. It's been, uh, it's been awesome, buddy. Can't wait to talk to you again soon. Join us on Ben to learn the cutting edge techniques to take control of your body, your brain and create your greatest life. This podcast is for information purposes only. The statements and views on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Ben Pekulski and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. This podcast may contain paid endorsements or advertisements for products or services. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest in products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.